John and Shitsu, thank you so much for joining me today. My first question for you is what event or beliefs in your youth led you to become an activist? Connie, we had talked about the, the term activist and I'm, I wasn't sure that I qualified for that technically and Chitsu and I had also discussed it. Uh, I'm not really sure that, that I am. I know I'm a school teacher. In teaching school, you are naturally involved in activism or and activities that help and promote uh, change and the betterment of society. I think that, that I can agree with. Uh, as far as when it started, I think uh, my parents, of course, being alive during the segregated times in the South and the U.S. were by nature, by definition, by virtue of just being alive, uh, activists, you might say, because that was the only way to survive, was to be actively promoting uh, compassion and survival for everyone, not just for themselves. So I learned from them how to do that, and I guess we called it in our house the shadow school. There were those in the community who were in more of the spotlight, and they would be out front taking the blows and, and speaking out directly and publicly. Whereas my parents worked very quietly, just as strongly in the background. And I learned that technique, uh, I think more in the in foremost in my life as a way of, of promoting compassion and trying to help with social change. I think that's my beginning. Shitsu, how about you? I'll just first introduce myself. So um, like my name is Chitsu Tenzin. Um, I'm a rising sophomore at Harvard. Uh, and I'm like hoping to study in, or concentrate in social studies with a secondary in education studies. And I guess like, you know, I was talking to Mr. Hunter about this before because I was kind of nervous about this call. And I was trying to think, you know, like, what does it mean to be an activist, especially um, as someone who's still considered youth and still learning throughout this whole process? And like I even looked it up, like an activist is someone who campaigns for social or political change, right? And so I don't really know if I identify with that because I think there are issues that I'm really passionate about um, and I take action on. But yeah, I just don't know if I can continuously identify myself as like, this is my job description, activist, right? But I will say like different events that led me towards activism, my ethnic identity, uh, my family is from Tibet. So growing up um, in the United States from a young age, I kind of had this moral sense of, you know, right or wrong. I don't know if you're familiar with anything relating to Tibet um, or the Tibetan movement, but it is a huge activist movement. Um, so just kind of from a young age being taught about this, sometimes attending protests or hearing about on news, kind of, I think, cultivated this deep sense of responsibility to act when issues are tough um, and things that I believe in. Uh, and then also along the way, like Mr. Hunter was um, my, one of my teachers in elementary school. And obviously he's a very impactful teacher and has left a large imprint on me because I'm still with him today, <laughs> you know, many, many years later. And people like him, who educated me and showed me different issues that I can care about and gave me the resources to learn about them, I think has led me to further see what kind of action I can take on them. Thank you, Shitsu. That was a great perspective because I think we don't need to have the activist label put on us necessarily. It just, I think you talked about a responsibility to act in situations and sometimes that's what we feel and we're a lot of other things as well but that responsibility kind of is ingrained and in, clearly in who you are <laughs> yeah and later you're like oh maybe that's what activism is <laughs> you both talked about your youth and growing up and things that maybe drove you to feel a responsibility to act what continues to motivate you and guides you or gives you strength you know as long as we can draw breath we have an opportunity to, to change and to make things better for ourselves and for others. So as long as we have this, this precious human life opportunity, there's always a chance for something to go right, something to, to do better and improve. Uh, I've learned this a lot from actually talking with my students from Chitsu and her father. And that has been inspiring that, you know, as long as we're able, we can still do something, we can still hope, I guess you'd say. I'm more for action than I am for hope, but hope can be useful at certain stages. So what's inspired me particularly is working with children because every time you meet a child, every time you enter a classroom, every time we start this world peace game activity, we see an entirely 
fresh, new room full of opportunities. There are 35 children playing the game, 30 adults watching, and there's that many possibilities of something going right, something becoming better. And in the process, we can see children working through things to become better. If I am watching my own mind, my own mind stream, and not trying to superimpose the past conventions and ideas I was taught, it's okay that I have them and I might share them sometimes, but if I unconsciously am always superimposing them, the children, I might not even realize that I'm limiting their thinking and creativity. So I have to start with myself, first watching my own uh, subtle biases, prejudices, my own subtle uh, prohibitions that are internal and that are very subtle, and weeding those things out so that I can get out of the way and let this inspirational moment that's in front of me actually happen. I can see what actually is going on as it is without my filters, my perspective, and my layers of experience and understanding coloring things so much I can't even see. So I'm inspired by the fresh moment of meeting each new person. Each new person is a totally brand new possibility of, of powerful uh, hope and beginning. So that every moment you meet somebody, I'm inspired. Every moment is always a chance for greatness. Something good could happen. So that's my inspiration is every time I wake up and I see another person coming, oh, I get so excited. Who knows who it could be, how it could, how it could go. Shitsu, how about you? Oh, that was such a good answer, Mr. Hunter. <laughs> from you, you know, it's actually, she was in my classroom for two years and I actually wrote about her in a book that I wrote, World Peace and Other Fourth Grade Achievements. She was one of the role models for me as a nine-year-old when she stood up in class and demanded that the other students have compassion for each other and stop being so selfish. Wow, I was really brazen. <laughs> <laughs> but very true, very cool. One of my favorite things that Mr. Hunter sometimes says is, oh, like to be talking about something and he'll just say like the simple, you know, you know, someone has to do it, right? And I think that's a very like, simple phrase but has a lot of meaning answering the question of what motivates you or continues to motivate me yeah definitely other people i think you always have you know great inspirations you can look up to you know like malala and um especially other youth activists like um the during the parkland um the march for our lives movement like the, those young leaders are so inspiring and really show that youth can make change. And then you have other people in your local community that take on arms. Like I would consider Mr. Hunter an inspiration of someone who continues to inspire me to act and follow and give me courage on when taking action. Um, and I think another thing that really inspires me is like just constantly learning. If you really want to be an activist, I think you need to have a vision. That's the most important. I think I a thing I think um and sometimes it's overlooked right because when we say activism it's just kind of like this verb of moving um but where are you going right <laughs> you, you have to know where you're going towards I'm in a club um it's called politics race and ethnicity and we had a guest speaker her name was Latasha Brown um she is part of the black votes campaign um in Atlanta Georgia and she asked us this really simple question um and she asked you know imagine or envision a world without racism and she asked us to raise our hands right and a group a room full of Harvard students could not raise their hand and imagine that and here we are in a club that's debating about this topic that's constantly reflecting on it but we couldn't even imagine what we were working towards right and that kind of example was like aha like, I need to reflect on what I want and what I'm envisioning. And that's how I can really continue to move towards it. Going from that, what advice do you have for, for youth? And I won't even call them activists. I'll just say for youth. I've learned never to give advice. Uh, my father and my mother were very famous, famous and they were known for never giving advice. But of course they had ideas that they would share. So I can say from my experience, what I've learned and what I've seen work and what I think might be universal, the first step for me has always been self-introspection. It starts where I am in the moment, looking into myself, as I said earlier, my own mind stream, because there are so many thoughts and they're continuous. And if I'm not even aware of what I'm thinking and how I'm thinking, the trend of it, or the vision I have internally, as Chitsu said, then I won't even know what I'm doing. I'll simply be impulsively responding all the time. 
So this turning inward and self-examination to actually minutely look at my own trend of thinking and then decide how I wanted to go and to start to weed out things I don't want, uh, attitudes I don't need, things that are not viable, not sustainable, not helpful, because they're very subtle. Once I start to do that, then I can begin to move out into the world. And the second stage, the second thing I think, is to think about collective wisdom. You know, I might think I'm learned or I've been to a college and I've learned quite a bit and I've, I'm such and such an age, but no one can do it by themselves. No one can change everything by themselves. Change often does start with a one unique individual, but to have that change enacted globally, it requires collective wisdom, not just collective knowledge or collective action, but wisdom, which is an entirely different thing and a deeper thing which is a, a discernment at a very deep level, globally and comprehensively in my view, about the consequences, the parameters of things, the real meaning and intent before action even starts. I know we're often tempted to act impulsively. We're encouraged to do that. You know, advertisers and big businesses want us to quickly do something to produce a result that they would like. But this slowing down or allowing, we call it in the World Peace Game, empty space, the empty space to pause and to make meaning of things ourselves before we move forward, then that I think is helpful. But the third thing would be passion, and that is supporting the real loves and passions of those we work with, which means we have to know who they are, what they really love and care about, and then we try to couple our purpose, our design, our hope with their passion. If we can join those two things together, then their passion will drive the movement of, of change and learning. You know, in classrooms, if I have a skateboarder and I'm trying to teach geometry, I've got to somehow merge or marry or combine geometry with their passion so that their love of skateboarding will propel them into learning geometry. And finally, the last thing I think would be just compassion, just allowing and developing opportunities, not preaching it or teaching it, this is what it is and what you should do, but by first being that ourselves, and then allowing others the opportunity and space, again, empty space, to feel and develop spontaneous compassion. Those things are, I would, I guess, encourage people to consider. I wouldn't say advise, but I found them to be useful and helpful to me in making change and becoming more active in society. Yeah, I totally agree with Mr. Hunter. And I think, you know, for youth especially, um, finding people like Mr. Hunter to support our goals and our vision and our passions is really, really important, right? Finding your allies. And, you know, advice, like, I'm still learning. I'm still on my youth activist journey, I guess you could say. I think one thing I'm really, I'm always trying to reflect on and be conscientious of is you're always learning and you're always in a constant state of educating yourself. Um, so never uh, overestimate <laughs> your um, capacity, but also don't underestimate yourself either. I think sometimes youth is discouraged to act because we don't feel like our voices are being heard, uh, but that should actually, you know, encourage us more to try harder and work um, towards that vision. If it's a good idea, if it's the right thing to do, it shouldn't matter who it's coming from, right? Another thing I was, I would say it's kind of something I've been noticing and I've been like a warning, I guess, but not to be complacent in a sense. Um, I think especially for youth um, these days, activism is a very, like we were saying earlier, it, there's a new definition for it, um, right? And especially with social media, um, new forms of activism are taking place. And some of it is great and really useful to spreading awareness, spreading information. Um, but then some of it can be harmful because uh, we think, or at least I've experienced like moments where even I like retweet something or I share something on my Instagram and I think, ah, my job is done, right? Um, but that's that's not what, what we're talking about, right? Um, so always trying to see like, what else can I do in my capacity? Just constantly teaching myself and learning and listening. Wow, bravo, bravo. Thank you both so very, very much.